Can you hear me good? Yeah. What? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, in case I don't know if you've been watching on uh, Facebook or whatnot, but uh, we've been doing a, a long series. Seems like about three years long. And uh, I think I pretty much finished uh, finished it up last week, but today... Uh, Kind of give you the remnants of it. Uh, deal with some principles, uh, uh, things that we already know, really, but uh, just kind of tie it with some principles. Uh, hopefully, you got something from it. Uh, hopefully, you can understand that you can change your life by your words, or you can make your life miserable by your words. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, as I say, we're king and priest, right? And uh, I said so many times, what a king, a king doesn't fight, right? He decrees. And when he decrees, it becomes. And it's the same way with God. And we're made in the image of God. And I always told you that he's <clears throat> given us our mouthpiece or our tongues not to drink coke with from Sonic or not to eat food with that your wife may come, but to mostly chart your course in life. To cause your life to always be going in an upward and forward direction. So you can always be making progress. So things can always be working out for you on your behalf. Alright? Uh, now today I want to start with the predisposed principle. The predisposed principle. Alright? And those that have your Bibles, if you would... Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. I'm willing to bet you 50 cents that you never read this before. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. The predisposed principle. And remember we talked about parts for your life. You can bring destruction into your life, right? Or you can bring blessing into your life. All right. So I want to talk about the predisposed principle. Are we at Genesis chapter 2 verse 8? Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Before I get there, to give you an understanding of what I'm saying, a lot of times when we go to the doctors, right, uh, I always tell you they try to trace your family history. Uh, are certain things hereditary? Uh, did your mother have this? Did your father have this? Uh, they're trying to backtrack your bloodline, all right? They're trying to see if you were predisposed to something before you ever entered the world. Why? Because whatever predisposed, if you are, is usually tied to your bloodline. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. But that works. In other ways also. Alright. Now let me pick up my reading. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. It says. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man who he had formed. Now. We know that. God uh, on the scene of Genesis. He made everything good. But notice. He did not put man. Or bring man upon the scene until everything was made better. He was placed in a garden, all right? He was placed, I, I usually, I call it heaven here on earth. Why? Because it's an extension of heaven there. It's God's dwelling place. That's where he came to visit with Adam in the cool of the day, right? So it's God's dwelling place. So we're not just talking about a geographical environment. Are you with me? But we're also talking about an environment that concerns man's life. Would you all agree that we're all created in Adam? I know that we're made in the image of God, but we are also created in Adam. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, Genesis, what is it, 2 and 21, I believe, when he made woman and he took a rib from Adam. And he says he made woman and he brought the woman to Adam. See, it wasn't just woman. But it's also the whole entire creation of man. 
that was pulled out of there too. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. If it was just woman, then why did everybody fall when Adam fell? It would be impossible to fall in him if we were not created in him. Yes. Are you with me? So since Adam represents man, he was placed in a garden. So that means before I was ever born, before I was ever thought of, I was placed in a blessed environment called the garden. Why? Because I was created in him. So that means that I was predisposed to an environment of blessing. Are oh, you with me? Yeah. Don't get quiet on me here. I'm trying to, does that make sense to you? It does. Yes, come on. So you can tell your neighbor, say you were, before you were even born, you were predisposed, you were born in an environment of blessing. Think about it. Adam's life was only going one way, the way that ours should go, upward and forward. Never backwards, upward and forward. He had everything done for him, everything. I know it says that he was to keep the garden, but we can get on that on another, on another day. But I don't think he worked in the garden. I don't think he worked until he was put out of the garden. Mm -hmm. But he was blessed. Yes. He was predisposed to this environment. That's right. My question is, what about you? What environment are you in? What environment have you been predisposed to? What environment have you created around your life that surrounds your life? How are things going with you in your life? Your day-to-day, -day, how is it on your job? How is it at your home? How is it that whenever you come in contact with somebody, are you a blessing or are you a takeaway? Which one are you? How is the world going with you? Oh, boy. Can I go on here? Yeah. Well, now, think about it. We always want something as a human being that's what? Better. We want better homes, better cars, uh, better clothes, uh, uh, better everything. But why is that? Some people say, oh, you know, you're being greedy. You're not being greedy. You were already predisposed to a better life. So why is it wrong to want better? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, let me go on here. Does that make sense to you so far? Uh -huh. All right. Let's go a little further here. We were predisposed to destruction. All right. Let's start at Psalm chapter 51, verse 5. I'm going somewhere. I'm trying to get there. Give me a minute. We were predisposed to destruction. Amen. I like that key says strong so they really hear you. Psalm 51, chapter 5. All right. Are we there? Okay. Now, David is trying to communicate to us something beautiful here. He says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, David wasn't saying, oh, they had me out of wedlock, Jesse and so-and-so. <laughs> he wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying that they had him out of wedlock. What was he saying here? He's trying to give us the presupposed principle of destruction. He said, I was born in a sinful state. In fact, I was born at a time when Christ had not yet come to save the world. He says, my parents, he said, they were sinful and I was conceived in sin in a state of iniquity and I was sinful too. Why? Because Christ had not rescued anyone. He has not yet come, died, and resurrected. So that means that they're in a sinful state. How did he get to the sinful state? We know because Adam did what he did. Remember, Adam is your family bloodline. That's right. Many Christians are still tracing their bloodline to Adam. And then they'll wonder why they're sick. They'll wonder why they're broke. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You never trace, as I say again, you never trace your bloodline to Adam or from Adam. But you always trace it from Christ. But David is trying to let us know something. That he was predisposed to sin. 
He became a sinner. In other words, he had the disease that he was diagnosed with. Why? Because they traced it back to Adam and they said, you are a sinner. Why? Because one man sinned, therefore all men have sinned. I was predisposed to destruction. God said, don't eat. He said, you can eat freely of this and this, but don't eat from this. So his act that he committed was an act of destruction. But that's not the only way that you can destroy your life. If he, uh, if he did an act of destruction, what do you think your words are when you speak it ill towards your life? It is an act of destruction. No wonder why you can speak certain words towards your life and it can go in the direction of blessing. Why? Because you were predisposed to it. And no wonder why you can speak words that consider that that's ill towards your life and it can go in the way of destruction. Why? Because you were predisposed to it before you were ever born. Are you with me? Oh dear Lord. I'm trying to go somewhere. Stay with me here. But can you see what David is saying? I was conceived in a state of iniquity. It was a time before Christ, before he came to save the world, before he died and resurrected, before he gave me the opportunity to be born again. I was predisposed. Oh dear. I'm going to go on. Don't fall asleep on me here. Why not? Oh dear Lord. Now, I said that man was in that environment, right, he was placed in a garden. But he was also kicked out of the garden, according to Genesis 3 and 24. And I told you, he wasn't kicked out of the garden because he sinned. But he was kicked out of the garden because God needed to protect the tree of life. He said, this man, he, he sinned. He knows between right and wrong and good and evil. What makes me want to think that he'll eat of the tree of life? If he ate of the tree of life, he would be forever in his sin. Mm -hmm. He had someone that was kind of going to deliver us from the sin named Christ. So he would eat of the tree of life, but yet he would still be in his fallen condition. Are you with me? So now he's outside of the garden. Now he had to work. So now he was taken from an environment of blessing and put in an environment of toiling. So now because he's kicked out of the garden, he has to work when he didn't have to work for what he already had. But he was predisposed. I mean, we were predisposed. So now you see that we were still predisposed to a great environment or an environment of blessing. And we was also predisposed to an environment of destruction. All because of Adam. Once again, I'm not just talking about the geographical location outside of the garden. But I'm talking about the environment that surrounds or concerns a man's life. Oh, you're still there. Mm -hmm. Come on. All right. Who you're making me work here? You're serious. I like this. Now, let me read this. The final verdict here. So I, Adam committed an act that disposed the entire human race to destruction. That's why when we speak words, our lives gravitate gravitate towards blessings and destruction, depending on what we are saying, because your life will gravitate to something. That is familiar with. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me go on. Let's talk about the examine your life and search for something better principle. Examine your life and search for something better principle. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Examine your life. And search for something better. Principle. We should always be searching for something better. Have you read this before? <laughs> Hallelujah. I just want to point out something here. All right. It reads, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form 
and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Would you agree that God is our all-knowing, right? Yes. Even though he was all-knowing, I believe that God was on the scene examining a chaotic mass in Genesis. He was examining. Seeing he was, he, he performed assessment, so to speak. He was assessing the damage. What is going on? This and that. What do I need to correct? What do I need to fix? What do I need to repair? Honestly, that's the same thing that you should be doing in your lives. You have to put your lives under examination. You have to do an assessment of your life. To see where it's going. To see where it's come from. See, you're only connected to your history. Why? Why? Why do we need to know that we're connected to Adam in a sense? Why? Because we can know where we're going. If you never know where you've been, how are you going to know where you're going? If you never know where you started, how are you going to end up where you need to be? Are you with me? Oh, dear Lord. But we must examine our lives to see the damage that we have caused. How? By our words. Examine it. Or you're still there. All right. Now, I went there for that one reason. And I want you to see it. I'm going to reiterate it. I believe God was on the scene accessing the damage. But are you doing the same in your life? Only a question you can answer. If you never access the damage or do an assessment on your life, you'll never repair it. If you never decide and discover what's wrong, how can you repair it? If the, never, if the doctor never finds a condition within you, how can he diagnose you? If he can diagnose you, how can he fix you? Or you're still there. Mm -hmm. All right. I just thought I'd throw that in there for free. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get into some more. Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 12. Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 12. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> oh, boy. Hmm. Genesis chapter 13, verse 10 to 12. We know that Lot, we already know that, uh, of course, there's Abram and nephew, and that they were journeying together and whatnot, and their, uh, their homeboy, I'll say. <laughs> they were quarreling with each other, all right, you know, and uh, so Abraham says, hey, we don't need to be fighting. We're family for one. He says, our servants, your servants, and my servants, we don't need to be fighting with each other. So let's split up, all right? So that's where we are. And now I pick, I pick up my reading. It says, And a lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of joy. It says, That is what, I mean, that, that it was well watered everywhere. It says, Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, Even as the garden, I mean, garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. It says, Then a lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. And it says, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, he's searching. He's assessing. He's, he's looking at the land. He's looking for something better. It says, behold, he beheld. He's seen. So he was looking. What am I saying? Sometimes our lives are looking for a better place to be. And we don't even realize it. He's seeing. He's looking. He's examining. He's seeing out. That land was well watered. Abraham had to take the land and probably wasn't well watered. But Abraham was a man that worked in blessing. But Lot, as a humanistic, why? Because we were predisposed to something great, to something of blessing. All right? In the garden, it was world water just like this. We were already predisposed to this. So he was already making his choice because he was predisposed to like something better. Genesis 
your life will always gravitate towards something better. It is never comfortable, even though you may not know it, your life is never comfortable in the wrong situation because it's always looking for something better. It is never content. It is never at rest because it's always searching, examining, even when you are not, we're looking for something better. Are you with me? Can you see that? Am I losing anyone? Am I, am I making sense? Okay. Now, I want to say this. Just as Lot had to travel from his current destination to the one that he was in search of that he was looking for, all right, so does our lives by the aircraft of our words. What am I saying? Your words become the airport, I mean the aircraft that transports your life from one destination to the next. Doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. Doesn't matter. And I always say your life becomes the passenger in that aircraft and it goes to an unwanted destination. Doesn't matter what, it, it depends on what you say. It depends on, are you speaking blessing or are you speaking curses over your life? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that you don't really want to go there, but you're saying it. It becomes an aircraft. Just as he walked from where he was to Sodom and Gomorrah to pitch his tent, your words carry you. They cause you to travel. They cause your life to travel. Why? Because I said before, they go before you. And they become your tomorrow. Oh, boy. Whew. Anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Now, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 through 22. I hope I don't finish too early. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 through 22. And we're still on the principle, examine your life and search for something better principle. Amen. Amen. All right. There you go, Keith. All right. Are we there? Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 through 22. Amen. All right. Amen. It says, and he saith unto them, is that what you're reading? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straight away left their nets, and they followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and his ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now, these were fishermen. These were fishermen. But did you see how quickly they put down their nets and they followed him? Now, Yes, they have picked them up occasionally. But he says, I'll make you a fisherman of men. So that means to me, somewhere along the lines, they had to be thinking, there must be more to life. There must be more to life. I have to be born for a purpose other than this. How is my life going? Where do I want my life to be? Do I just want my life to be at a standstill or do I want my life to make upward and forward progress? Do I want to move forward? It's a question that we must ask ourselves. What am I? What is my purpose? What am I here for? Did I destroy my life or am I blessing my life? Is my life where it is because of me or is my life where it is because of someone else? Well, can I tell you, it's not because of someone else. It's all because of you. It's not even because of God. It's because of you. Amen. But these are questions that you must ask yourself as a disciples. Isn't there more to me? Do you ever ask yourself this question? Do you ever come to a point in life where you say, I need to do more. I was born to do more. 
Maybe you even cursed your life with your words before. But you say, I need to give or burst the curse. I need to move forward. I need to do something big. I need to be a blessing. But you must examine your life and you must search for better. They had to be searching for better. And they found better. Who? No one other than in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Yes. Oh boy, I'm winging it here. <laughs> oh dear Lord. Can you see that? Yes. Have you really, have you, think about it, have, have you asked yourself those necessary questions? I was told some time ago when I first started in ministry, son, don't pass through this world for nothing. Many Christians are passing through this world for nothing without a purpose. Oh, I have my salvation. If I die today, I'm going to heaven. Okay, but what are you doing while you're here? They found their purpose. It wasn't just casting nets and fishing, but it was a fisherman, a man. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> Can I go on? Mm -hmm. Just principles, fundamentals, principles. Change your life with the word principle. John chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Change your life with the word principle. I don't know if I said that right. Change your life with the word principle. Just I mean, you know, what verse was it? John chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Yeah. Take your time. I got you all night. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Or should I say, I have you all night? Tell me, say it. All right. Yes, you might you may correct me, right? <laughs> I want to get my English together. <laughs> okay. Are you okay? Everybody all right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll pick up my reading. And a certain man was there. That's what you're reading? Mm -hmm. Which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Can you imagine being in a condition that long? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? 38 years. My question is, I wonder how old he was. But 38 years being in the same condition. Can I tell you something? That's too long for a Christian to be in any condition. It's too long for a Christian to be in any condition. That means the condition has you, but you don't have the condition. That means the condition has brought you under subjection instead of you bringing the condition under subjection. 38 years. All right, just start out there for free. It says, when Jesus saw the line and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, will thou be made whole? Some may say a stupid question, but no, it's a great question. Why? Because many of us get used to being in the same condition. We become comfortable with being in the same condition in life. Some people say, well, you're too close to the matter, so you really can't see it. But we get used to being in the same condition. I know people who are used to being in the same condition. Not harping on them, but I'm saying they don't have to be in that condition if they allow the word to change their life. Oh, you're still there. He says, the important man answered, said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step it down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately 
The man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And I'll stop right there. Now, 38 years. I asked you one of my famous questions. Is Jesus the word that became flesh? He's the word that became flesh, right? So this man allowed the word to change his life after 38 years. He changed his man's life. My question is, are you allowing to change yours? If not, what's the hold up? What's the hold up? 38 years. 38 years. Always tell a Christian, if you want the word to change your life, you must become acquainted with the word. Amen. If you never become acquainted with the word, how can you ever use it to change your life? My wife knows that I'm not a handyman type of guy. She didn't marry me for that because I'll break everything. <laughs> right? But if I was trying to put something together, but I did not read the instructions and become acquainted with the instructions, how can I get it to work? Yeah. It's the same way with the Word. You must become acquainted with it. See, I tell you, the Word of God, oh dear. The word of God is not supposed to do anything for you but to convict you and to teach you and things of that nature. But it's you who are supposed to do something with the word of God. Always go back to example, right? The uh, word of God, right? It's a sword of the spirit, right? Think that the Bible tells us that? Well, think about it. That sword cannot swing itself. If anyone is in battle, if me and you are in battle, keep you know, with all that stuff with a face mask on it. If we're in battle, doesn't it take my energy and your energy to swing the sword? Mm -hmm. It's the same way spiritually with the Word of God. That sword would not swing itself, but you must swing the sword. Are you with me? So a lot of Christians don't have or don't affect change because. They're not familiar or acquainted with the word. Once you become acquainted with the word, then you can be exactly what that word says you are. That's when it becomes sharper than a two-edged sword. And it can cut through cancer. Do you understand? Cut through diabetes. Cut through COVID. Whatever you needed to cut through, it can cut through. But when you release it, If you never release the word inside of you, it won't change a thing. But when you release it, that's when change begins to take place. Or you're still there. Yeah. But you have to change your life with the word principle. Think how many people Jesus came in contact with. Why he was walking through the gospels. Think about how many lives he changed. And I'm sure that now they are not, they are all not recorded as the Bible tells us. But think about how many how many lives he changed. I told you before, right? I said Jesus is the Word that became flesh, and since we're in Him, then we're the Word in flesh. So if He was walking in the Bible, they changed lives. What makes you any different? You should be doing the same thing. Are you with me? Yeah. Change your life with the word principle. Oh dear. Man, I might finish early here. Give me one second here. Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. I'm going to feel real bad if I finish too early. Okay. Let's talk about the nothing has to be permanent principle. Nothing has to be permanent principle. Let's start at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Just to give you an idea of where I'm going. Nothing has to be permanent principle. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, three. verses 1 through 3. Amen. 
It says to everything there is a season. Question. Do seasons stay or do they come and go? They come and go. It says in a time to every purpose. You know, that this is a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Now, we can gather from this that time expires. If you say Bible study is from 7 to 8, which is an hour, at 8 o'clock, that hour has just, or that time has just, what, expired. Mm -hmm. So it's not permanent. Mm -hmm. It's only passing. A season, as she said, it's only passing. It's only passing. So why are so many Christians, <laughs> season becomes their life. Mm -hmm. The season seems to never change. Never change. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, I talked to you, you're telling me the same thing that you're telling me today. Oh, I have this issue. I have that issue. I have that issue. Now, one thing the Bible tells us, it says, trials and tribulations, basically, you shall have, John 16, 33. It says, well, be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. Right? The Bible tells us, I think in Isaiah 54 and 17, it says, um, no weapon that forms against me shall prosper. Never said that it wouldn't form. So you will have these troubles. You will have these seasons. But see, trouble only has permission, oh boy, to visit you. Mm -hmm. Come on. But it does not have permission to stay unless you give it. Yeah, right. And I say that again. Trouble only has permission to visit you. Why? Because of sin of Adam. Do you understand? When did trouble come into the world? Yeah, it was there. But then when, when did man get in trouble? When he sinned. So trouble has permission to visit you. Why does it stay so long? Because Christians, Christians are responsible for making it permanent in their lives. I think in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, somewhere it calls it a light affliction. A light affliction. A light affliction. It says, well, this passing hour or something like that, something to that credit. Meaning it only has permission to visit you. And that's the permission to visit you. Yeah, you're going to go through. Yes, you're going to have trials and tribulations. Yes, you're going to have seasons. But never forfeit the battle because of a season. Are you hearing me? I say again, never forfeit the battle. Why? Because of a season. Oh, dear Lord. So it's just a time. It doesn't have to be permanent. Can I go a little further here? Let's go to John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. John, I'm sorry. John chapter 3. Verses 3 through 7. Gospel John. I want to show you something that we probably read a lot of times, but I think God is saying more than we think that he's saying in it. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Amen. Amen. There you go. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old, if it is physical? It says, Can he enter uh, the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. This is marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, being born again is important. We'll become alive to God. 
We become alive to him. We become his child. And I always say that he loves us with the same love that he loved Jesus with. It's a different type of love. Why do I say that? Well, John 3 and 16 says what? Uh, For God so loved the who? That he gave his only who? Okay. So that means that's love for the whole sinful population of man. But when I become his own, he loves me with a different type of love. That's why I say that. Now, even though born again, born again is important, I can go so many avenues or so many different ways with that. But I believe God is saying something much more. When he's saying you must be born again, he's really telling us what many Christians don't see is your situation doesn't have to be permanent. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Why? You were a sinner, but if you're born again, you become a new man in Christ. So it's deeper than just being born again. But he's saying your situation, you don't have to remain in a situation that's permanent. He says, yes, Adam caused you to fall. Yes, you became a sinner because of one man's sin. He says, but you don't have to be a permanent sinner. He says, if you become born again, your situation is done away with. It is no longer permanent. Why? Because you catapulted yourself. Why? Out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And that's what I'm telling you today. Into the kingdom of light. Your situation doesn't have to be permanent. Amen. It's more than just be born again. That catapult you, it pulls you up out of that condition that you're in. Are you with me? Oh boy. See what I have. Okay. Let me move on here. Let's talk about the recreation and restoration principle. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Oh dear. Okay, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 28, real quick. Jeremiah chapter 4 verses 23 to 28 and I'm going to read from the Amplified I want you to hear it a little louder (laughs) just say amen when you get there amen All right. and it reads I looked at the earth in my vision in brackets I love the Amplified and behold It was as at the time of creation, formless and void, meaning before anything was made. All right? He says, and to the heavens, and they what? Had no light. He says, I looked at the mountains, and behold, they were trembling. And it says, and all the hills moved back and forth. He says, I looked, and behold, there was no man. He says, and all the birds of the air had fled. It says, I looked and behold, the fertile land was a wilderness. And it says, and all its cities were pulled down before the presence of the Lord, before his fierce anger. It says, therefore says the Lord, the whole land should be a desolation, yet I will not cause total destruction. For this reason, the earth shall mourn and the heavens above, above I mean, the, and the heavens above shall become dark. 
And because I have spoken, I have decided. And I will not change my mind, relent, nor will I turn back from it. What am I showing you here? On that scene of, Jesus, of Genesis, there's a res restoration process as well as a creation process. Some things were there. Some things were not there. Why am I telling you this? Some things may not be in your life. You may cannot see him with your physical eye. Let me not take you too fast. Look, let, me, let, me, let me explain. Let me, let me start here first. Do you remember? I said God has given you a character sketch of your life. Or he's giving you a character to play out in this life. I can also say he gave you a, a frame for your life. Jesus fit into the frame of his life. If his frame was spoken for, he would be born of a virgin. He would come and die for the sins of the world. The government would be upon his shoulder. What is that? That is a frame. That is a frame that God has designed for the life of Jesus. Nobody else but for the life of Jesus. But he's also designed a frame for your life. That fits your life. It cannot fit my life, but it fits your life. Mine cannot fit your life. But it's an individual frame for each of our lives. Sometimes we don't see things. Because he's given us that frame, there are certain things that already exist in our life. But we don't see them. But how do we? We must discover them. And then how do we bring them to fruition? We have to speak them forth. We have to speak them forth. When God pronounced judgment, look what happened. Judgment came. When you pronounce judgment over your life, judgment comes. Are you with me? By your words. Yeah. It comes. There are certain things that you are looking for that's already in your life. There were certain things that you could not see on the scenes of Genesis that was already there. He brought them into being. Are you with me? That's the same thing you can do in your life. If you bring something that's unwanted in your life, you can take it out of your life. If you need something in your life that may not exist, guess what? You can bring it into your life. How? By your words. Amen. You create with your mouth. With your mouth. Oh, you're still there. I wish I could really go more into it. But some things were already there. Some things were not. Some refer to the gap theory and things between verses 1 and 2. Some don't agree with it. Some do agree with it. But to me, the Bible explains it in other scriptures. Yeah, it, does. it says he did not create it to what? To be void. But he created it to what? Be inhabited. So that means some things were restored that were already there. Yes. What things in your life that you need restored? Only a question you can answer. That's what I always tell you. Just because you're so-called down and out, or just because things are not going your way, I can tell you all about that right now. Seeing things seem not to be going my way, but I have to speak it soon. Do you understand here? What do you need to bring into your life? What do you need to bring into your world? What do you need to bring into your aeon? You remember when I talked about the environment of the garden, right? I said it's just not a geographical environment. But it means the environment that concerns or surrounds a man's life. That's what I mean. Your environment, your aeon, your world. Specifically that the, uh, concerns you. Like I say, your job, your business. Your kids, your world, not her world, not his world, but your individual world. What do you need to bring into your world? What do you need to bring into your environment? You can bring it. Oh, boy. Oh, you're still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3.
if you get a chance, you have your Bibles on your phone, read Genesis uh, chapter 1, 1 through 3 in the Amplified and the Amplified Classic. It'll link you up with Hebrews 11 and 3 if you hadn't already saw that. Just say amen when you get to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Amen. Yes, man. Take your time. We got another 30 minutes. Mm. <laughs> 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 oh, we there? Yeah. All right. Now she getting up with me in the morning. <laughs> oh, you got an early one? I, I got you. It says through what? Faith. Through hope? Faith. Oh, okay. Faith. Okay. Faith. Oh, boy. So through faith. It says through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the who? Word. All right. Word of God. It says so that things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. So we can say God called those things and they became. Question. Have you ever called something from the invisible and made it visible in your life? Just a question. Have you ever called things from the invisible to the visible in your life in which you can see it? Have you? Just a question. Things that you can't see, things that you need, things that you require. Have you ever called them from the invisible into the visible? So you may get not see them with your physical eye, but you can see them with the eyes of the spirit. Okay. You see, you see, you see. Do you understand? Yes. Come on. What the Bible tells us, it says we walk by what and not by sight, by faith. Come on. So that means that you need your physical senses to become bind in order to see in the realm of the spirit. I ask you again, have you ever called anything that was invisible to the visible in your life? We walk by faith and not by sight. Then it says, through faith we understand. That means faith is capable of bringing understanding. We were not on the scene in Genesis. Were you there or were you there? No, we were not there. We were not yet born. Even though we had our mother and father already picked out the other day's story. Oh, you're with me. But you were not there. But it says, through faith we can come to this understanding. So faith brings me understanding. Why? Because I see it. I see it through my spiritual eyes. Do you understand it? It's in faith allows me, oh dear, get this. It allows me to walk back to the scene of Genesis. Do you understand? It, it allows me to go back in biblical day reality. It allows me to see what it says the, the, the sons of God were shouting when he brought it into being, right? Doesn't the Bible tell us that? So that means it allows me to walk back to the scene of Genesis. And I was up there spectating how through faith, do you understand? Through faith. It allows me to travel back in time. I could not see it with my physical eyes. I had to see it through my spiritual eyes of faith. And it allowed me to walk back. Do you all oh, get it? You, it? It allows me to walk back to the scene of Genesis. So through my eyes of faith, I was there with God. I was there with the angels. Do you understand? I was there with Christ. Do you understand? I was there with the Holy Spirit. I was there how? Through faith. It allowed me to see. <clears throat> Can I read something to you? Let me read 11, uh, Hebrews 11 and 3 from the message real quickly here. It says, by faith, we see the world. Oh, dear. It says, we see the world called into existence by God's word. What we see created by what we don't see. You, let me read it. It says, by faith, we see the world called. Do you understand? That's where I got that from. That's why I got it from. It says we see the world called into being. How through faith? I wasn't there. Did Jesus die? The Bible tells me so. But how do I see it? Through faith. It's just a beautiful story to some. What makes it reality to me? By faith. 
Oh, you're still there. You're making me want to get Question. Have you ever allowed your faith to take you to a scene in the future of something that you're trying to achieve? See, don't look at your finances. Oh, dear. Don't look at your finances about what you have. Oh, dear. But look at it through the eyes of faith. Do you understand? Hey, the Bible doesn't tell us that they inherited the, uh, the people of, oh, I call them the, the, the Faith Hall of Fame. They didn't inherit the promises. Do you understand? Not by what they had in their head, but through faith. Do you understand here? See, we become limited as Christians when we start thinking natural. Oh, I can't possibly afford that. Who says that? That's what your bank account says? What does God say? He has the final say. So do you understand? Amen. That's what you must understand. And that's why we don't achieve or get some of the things that we want. The Bible says he can give you the desires of the heart. Do you understand? All those things are not spiritual. Yeah. All those things are not spiritual. Right. I tell you again, why wouldn't you want you to have a house? Why wouldn't you want to have your land? Didn't he give you the land of Canaan? Are, are you with me? You got to start thinking biblically. Why would he not have given them a home? Didn't he provide a home in heaven for you? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. What? So that you may come where I am also. That is your spiritual home. So why would he give you a physical home? Why would he make it work out for you? You got to start thinking that way. Oh, dear Lord. Too late to get excited now. <laughs> but can you see it? Amen. Amen. You must allow your faith to Take you into your future. You must see it. You must see it. I see it. I see it. I see the land. Do you understand? I see it. I see it. I see my child coming out. Do you understand? That's what you must do. You must see it. I see the relationship being repaired. Do you understand? I must see it. It doesn't seem like so. Sometimes I'm just frustrated. But you must see it. See it. See it. Just like it could take us back to the scene of Genesis. And we can witness what occurred. Through faith. Why can't you witness what's about to occur. Or what's coming to you. By faith. You're making me preach here. Oh you're with me. Did you know that you're somebody. Did you know that you're somebody. Do you know that you're a blessing. You're a blessing to someone. Start thinking that way. I'm a blessing. Say it, say it, say it, say it to your neighbor. Say, I'm a blessing. Yeah. Say it, say it, mean it. I'm yeah, I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing. And that's the way you start thinking. I'm the kingdom's kid. Everywhere I enter, I enter as a blessing. Do you understand? There's nobody that I cannot reach. Do you have that mentality? There's nobody that I come in contact with that I cannot change their life with the word that's in me. Do you understand? I make everything better. Everything that I have to do with it, I'm a success. Do you understand? I'm a success if I shut my eyes. Do you understand? I am a success if I do nothing. Why? Because everything I touch, everything I put my hands to, I am a success. That's what I say at work. That's what I say. I'm a success. That's what I tell them sometimes. I say, oh, don't worry about it. I say, it's a success. I already know it. Why? Because I am a child of God. If I'm involved with it, it has no choice but to be a success. You don't have to tell me tonight it was a success. Why? Because in my heart, heart, and my spirit, I'm not arrogant, but I know it had to be a success. Why? Because you cannot stop having me go along hearing the word of God and not be a success. Oh, boy. I told you some of you think I'm arrogant if I tell you. What am I doing? I'm speaking things. That's what I say. You don't always need prayer. No. You must catapult that level sometimes. Certain situations require prayer. Certain situations require you speaking to. You speak to or you speak it forth like it's already done. I thank you for restoring what the canker worm is eating. I thank you for restoring what the calipeter is eating. I thank you for restoring what the locusts are eating. You said you restore my wasted years. I thank you, Lord. Do you understand? I am a success. I am the best that you may. Do you understand? You talk that talk. Talk that talk. And the devil will be like, oh, he got a hold of something. She has a hold of something. Talk that talk. Oh, devil, you might have knocked me down, but watch me. I'm right back up. There's nothing that you can do with me. I am forgiven and I am free. I am blessed. Going out in the city, coming. Do you understand? 
That's the talk that you talk. Oh dear, I needed this morning, you and I. God bless me. All right, maybe we pray. Our Father, we thank you right now. We thank you that everything we touch, we are success. We thank you that we take after you, Lord Jesus, and you are such a success. We thank you that you're so loving, you're so kind. We thank you that you're a great, great father. But we thank you that you love us in spite of the stupid things we may do, God. We thank you for the forgiveness that you have already granted us in Christ, God. We thank you, Lord. I thank you for each and every soul right here, Lord. I touch them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Everything in between, every fiber of the blood, every cell of the blood, God. I thank you right now. Lord, every word that they tread upon, they will change. Lord, I thank you. Whatever they're asking you for, Lord Jesus, they receive by faith right now. I thank you. In Jesus' name we say, amen. 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 Thank you for having me.